Living things appear to have design written all over them. And this applies to the deepest levels of complexity as well as superficial levels. My goal is to bring these questions, the big metaphysical questions about why there is something rather than nothing back onto the philosophical center stage, as it were. I want to find ways of thinking about these questions that are not going to be either condemned as um, religious in a way that many of us no longer find adequate um, or satisfying or overly scientific. I believe that the world, in the sense of all that there is apart from God, exists because God sustains it in existence. If it had a beginning, God created that first state of the world. And if it had no beginning, God kept it in existence throughout past everlasting time. Things in the world behave almost entirely in accordance with scientific laws, and it is God who keeps those laws operative. Hinduism interests me partly because it takes precisely the mystery of existence, the fundamental reality we see unfolding around us as the core of its insights, at least in the tradition I'm looking at. Hello and welcome to Unbelievable, the show that aims to get Christians and non-Christians thinking about the topics that matter to all of us. I'm Ruth Jackson and in this week's edition of Unbelievable, we are teaming up with our friends at the Pan Psychast Philosophy Podcast for an event that they hosted in London recently. If you want more from Premier Unbelievable, please do like today's video and subscribe to the channel. You can also visit premierunbelievable.com. And do also check out the Pan Psycast YouTube channel and podcast because they have got lots of great conversations there. The event that you are about to hear, The Mystery of Existence, was recorded in front of a live audience back in June. Part one today will explore some really important questions such as why is there something rather than nothing? And how did our laws of nature end up being fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life? Well, we're going to be hearing from four of the biggest names in philosophy. Richard Dawkins, representing science and atheism. Jessica Frazier on Hinduism. Sylvia Jonas, speaking on Jewish philosophy. And Richard Swinburne, defending Christianity. They are going to be debating here and they're being moderated by the pan Psychast host, Jack Symes. So let's join their conversation. So we've agreed to limit our discussion this evening to three main questions. They are why there is something rather than nothing, how our laws of nature ended up being fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life, and where our natural environments and complex organisms came from. What's the origin of life more generally? We've got people representing different worldviews here from Christianity, experts on Hinduism, atheism, and Judaism as well. Richard Dawkins. Uh, this, we've got two Richards with us this evening, so excuse me for using full names very formally, but Richard Dawkins, would you like to begin with the motivations for why you would reject God as an explanation? No, that's for... not how I would like to begin. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm here to talk about science and biology, and the third of your, your three, three points, in other words. Mm -hmm. um, the mystery of existence is indeed a deeply profound mystery. And a biologist is perhaps best qualified of anybody to expound this mystery because, um, at least until 1859, it was a total mystery. The facts of life being both highly complex, almost unbelievably complex, and also carrying a gigantic illusion of design. Living things appear to have design written all over them. And this applies to the deepest levels of complexity as well as superficial levels. Complexity first. Um, the human brain has about 86 billion neurons and about 600 trillion connections between them. And if you were to count up the number of nerve impulses that are rocketing through your, like rifle bullets through your brain at the moment, it would be something like four quadrillion of these clicks, these mm -hmm. impulses per second. Com 
complexity of the brain, complexity of the rest of the body, every animal and plant, every bacterium is prodigiously complicated. The illusion of design, you can see this every time you see a camouflaged insect, a stick insect, a stick caterpillar, uh, a leaf insect, a stick caterpillar that has carved on its exterior leaf scars, perfect mimicry of a, of a real stick, mm. butterflies that have perfect mimicry of a leaf. Um, everything about a living organism screams at you, it's, it's designed. And until Darwin came along, that's what most people thought, almost everybody thought. Darwin had the effrontery almost to realize that it was possible that all this complexity and this illusion of design could come about through blind mechanical forces, evolution by natural selection. That degree of complexity and apparent design cannot just happen. It has to have a process leading up to it. It has to have a process leading from primeval simplicity to the complexity that we see around us at present. Simplicity is difficult enough to explain. That's the first of your things. Why is there something rather than nothing? But simplicity is by definition a whole lot easier to explain than complexity. And Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection in its most general form is the only explanation we know that, it, that can lead from simplicity to complexity which is why I stick my neck out and say that if there is life elsewhere in the universe, and I think there probably is, but if there is, then it will be Darwinian life. Every other detail may be different from life on this planet, but one thing I would bet on is that it will be Darwinian life. It will have come about by some version of random variation followed by non-random survival. That is the only formula I believe we know that is capable of lifting simplicity to the level of complexity. Uh, it gets a lot of help on this planet and probably elsewhere from what I've called evolutionary arms races. It's one thing for animals and plants to be adapted to the climate. That's relatively simple. But what happens in nature is that you have enemies which are evolving at the same time. And I think Darwin realized that the prodigies of complexity that we see are mostly the result of arms races. He didn't call them arms races, but he meant it. Arms races between predators and prey, parasites and hosts, males and females. When, the, when you are surrounded by other things that are evolving at the same time as you are, then you get an escalation. And it's that escalation between predators and prey, parasites and hosts, etc., that gives rise to these extraordinary levels of complexity that we see. Now, that's biology, and since Darwin, we in principle understand how, it's, how the trick is done. The trick is done by non-random survival of random variation, natural selection. Pushing back before biology, the origin of all things, the origin of the universe, the origin of, of matter, the origin of the laws of physics. Uh, we need a physics on this, a physicist on this panel. I think we haven't got one. Um, because that's, um, where the problem is at present. Biology is essentially solved. And that was the big one. William Paley in his book on natural theology in 1803 said that Physics is comparatively easy. Uh, it's biology that really demonstrates the, the role of the, of the creator. Mm. Um, and he said that apart from Saturn's ring, there's not a lot of complexity going on in the physical world. Um, he was right. But nevertheless, since biology is solved, we're now pushed back to physics and cosmology um, as the place where the mystery is now deepest. And as I said, I'm not qualified to talk about that. My mm. physicist friends are working on it. Uh, and um, I'm interested in, perhaps there are physicists here tonight who can uh, tell us what the present state of the art is on explaining things like the origin of the laws of physics, the origin of the um, fundamental constants, 
the half a dozen or so fundamental constants whose value is measured, but which is not, are not yet explained. And as you know, there's a, a strong argument to say that these, these um, fundamental constants are fine-tuned in the sense that if there were any of them were slightly different from what they are, then we would not have we would not have galaxies, we would not have matter, we would not have chemistry, we would not have biology, um, and we would not have us. Um, so there are various solutions to this riddle of where the fine-tuning comes from, um, and I think the one that is most favoured at the moment is the multiverse idea, that, that we are in one of a very large number of universes which have different laws of physics and different physical constants, and the anthropic principle, by the anthropic principle, we have to be in one of that a minority of universes which has the properties necessary to give rise to sentient beings such as us, capable of, of um, understanding it. Um, other, other physicists say that it's just we don't yet understand enough. There, there will come a time when we, when we have a theory of everything and then we will know why these physical constants have the values that they do and where the laws of physics come from. Um, so I would, divide, I would divide the problem into, into the biology problem, which was once thought to be huge, was huge, still is kind of huge, but the courage that we should get from the fact that Darwin solved that problem should lead us on to have courage to, have courage to feel that the same problem in physics will be solved. And... Um, I think I've probably had my time. No, that's, uh, that's wonderfully put. Uh, Richard Swinburne, would you like to jump in here? Because yeah, your yes, yes. view in terms of whether or not physics will eventually yeah, get there is, uh, could contrast well with Richard Dawkins's. Okay, I believe that the world, in the sense of all that there is apart from God, exists because God sustains it in existence. If it had a beginning, God created that first state of the world. And if it had no beginning, God kept it in existence throughout past everlasting time. Things in the world behave almost entirely in accordance with scientific laws, and it is God who keeps those laws operative. God does, however, in my view, give to human beings some very limited free will to make differences to the world, and God may <laughs> occasionally intervene in the world to bring about some event directly. I believe these things because I believe that theism, the hypothesis that there is a God, provides the most probable explanation of the most general features of the world. That there is a physical world, and the same applies if there is a multiverse, that it is governed almost entirely by simple comprehensible laws of nature, and that those laws are such as to bring about in the course of time, including via the mechanism of evolution, bring about in the course of time human bodies, and those bodies are the bodies of conscious human beings. Theism is rendered probable by these data in virtue of the very same criteria as a hypothesis of science, history, or detective work is made probable by its evidence. These criteria are, one, if the hypothesis is true, it's quite probable that we refine the data. Two, if the hypothesis is false, it's not at all probable that we would find the data. And three, the hypothesis is simple. Theism is a very simple hypothesis. It postulates the existence of only one entity, not many, one substance, as philosophers call it, God. And it postulates about him that he is essentially everlasting and omnipotent that is, able to do anything logically possible. So theism postulates that there are zero limits to God's length of time, life and zero limits to his power. Zero is a simple number, and so the whole nature of God is a very simple nature. All the other properties traditionally ascribed to God follow from these properties. For example, such a God is omniscient, that is, he knows anything, or to qualify that claim in the same way as the claim of omnipotence, that he knows everything logically possible to know, compatible with his omnipotence. Thus he will know of all actions whether or not they are good or bad. To know that an action is good to, is to have some inclination to do it. We humans, as well as having inclinations to do what is good, 
are also subject to counter-inclinations to do actions which are bad. The simplest and so most probable kind of God would not have bad inclinations, and so he will always do good actions. He will be perfectly good. Hence, God's omniscience and perfect goodness follow from his omnipotence, and so do all the other properties traditionally ascribed to God, such as being creator of any world there is. Being perfectly good, God would wish to spread goodness to create more good things. We humans are good things. We have powers to reason and to make small differences to ourselves, other people, and the world. But most of the, these great-making properties, which we have, with one exception, are properties possessed in far greater degree by God himself. But the one very good property which we possess and God does not possess is the power to choose freely between good and evil. God would think it good that there should be beings who can make a real differences to themselves, others, and the world for good or evil without being always programmed to do the good. Just, for example, as good parents who want their children to be good would not wish to give them a drug which would make them automatically do good actions. They would want the children to make up their own minds about what to do within limits. For this reason, it is probable that God would make humans, although it is also probable, though less probable, that he would make many other good things. But in order to make humans, he must give them bodies and so a physical world. He must make it governed by observable regularities simple enough for them to understand, because otherwise they will not know which actions of theirs will have which effects. They will not know what will happen if they set light to crops, whether that will destroy the crops or help them to grow, and so generally. But there will only be simple observable regularities if there are simple underlying laws of nature. Yet humans will only exist if those laws are such as to be compatible with the existence of humans, whether or not God makes them by an evolutionary process or creates them fully grown. And finally, of course, humans will not be able to reason and to make con choices unless they are conscious. Hence, if God seeks to bring about humans, he must bring about the necessary conditions for their existence, and those are the general features of the world which I have described, that there is a physical world governed in almost entirely by simple laws of nature, such as to be compatible with the existence of humans, and that humans are conscious. But of course, there isn't the slightest reason for supposing these things would occur unless there is a God. Why should there be a physical universe at all? If there is, why should it be governed by simple laws of nature, or any laws of nature at all? Without a hypothesis such as theism, one would expect the different chunks of matter to behave in entirely different ways from each other. But in fact, every fundamental particle in the universe behaves in exactly the same way as every other one in conformity with laws of nature. Unless someone arranged things in this way, it would be immensely improbable that this would happen, and an aspect of that is, of course, the fine-tuning. Likewise, it would be immensely improbable that the laws, even if they were simple and comprehensible, would be such as to bring about the evolution of humans. And there would have to be an enormous set of laws quite different from those of physical science to explain the evolution of consciousness. Maybe there are such laws, but again, this is not to be expected unless God made it so. Since the postulated God is simple, since these data are such as might probably occur if there is a God, and such as very probably would not occur if there is no God, I conclude that any rationally and scientifically minded person <coughs> must, on the basis of these data, conclude that there is a God. On the basis of these data, conclude that there is a God. Of course, there are other less general data to be taken into account, such as the fact of human suffering. And because I have only 10 minutes, I can only <laughs> say two or three sentences about this. But the basic reason why, given theism, we might expect suffering is that it is either the result of bad human choices, which God allows humans to make, or although caused by natural processes, 
It makes possible human choices of how to deal with it in good ways. Mm. And by the way we deal with our suffering, we have the opportunity to make ourselves saints. And what a good God would want of most of all of his children is that by their own free choices they would become saints. For these reasons, I hold traditional views of the existence and nature of God. And if I can't explain why there's a God, that casts no doubt on the correctness of my explanation of the general features of the world, just as a physicist can't explain why the fundamental laws of physics operate, that casts no laws, doubt on those laws being the fundamental laws of, part of physics. Thank you, Richard. You've finally tuned your answer to precisely 10 minutes there as well, so <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being so accurate. We are going to take a quick break now, but we would love to hear your thoughts. Do drop us an email at unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Or you can get in touch via social media at unbelievablefe for Twitter or facebook.com forward slash premier unbelievable. You're listening to Unbelievable teaming up with the Pan Psychast Philosophy podcast. And we're going to be back in just a moment to hear more from these amazing guests. The mind and brain are connected, but the scientific data doesn't enable you to establish the nature of that connection or the relationship. Just because science can't demonstrate that physical processes and mental processes are the same thing, that in and of itself doesn't give you any evidence that that's not the case either. Some people talk about seeing deceased relatives and communicating with them. This idea of floating up out of your body and watching things happen and being able to describe it afterwards, that could be formed in your imaginative mind. Conscious experience and brain processes are two fundamentally different things. I wonder if we're talking Would about- you like me to go out for a bit? You guys seem really <laughs> happy. <laughs> Welcome back to part two of this special Unbelievable, where we're showcasing a discussion that was recorded in London earlier this summer by the Pan Psychast Philosophy podcast team. The debate, which we've split into two parts, gathered four incredible minds. Richard Dawkins, representing science and atheism, Jessica Frazier on Hinduism, Sylvia Jonas speaking on Jewish philosophy, and Richard Swinburne defending Christianity. The four of these guys are being moderated by Pan Psychast host, Jack Symes. Sylvia, in an earlier draft of the book we put together, I described your view as making friends and enemies of, of everybody, and you didn't like the overly combative nature of, of my phrasing. So we, we changed it, but this might be a, a good way in, because you see virtues and vices in both the views that both Richards have presented here. How would you uh, approach the three mysteries we set out at the beginning and, well, we're becoming less and less mysteries as we're having the discussion here, but and also to compare your view with some of the others and begin contrasting them as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my perspective on these questions is completely from a philosophical point of view. Um, and I started thinking about these questions because I found it really puzzling, to put it mildly, perhaps even a little bit annoying, that... Um, the topic of theism and God mm -hmm. and religious belief and what it actually means to people has almost entirely vanished from, um, well, most graduate syllabuses that I've seen. So um, even though now we're sitting here with people who are mainly or uh, thinking uh, to a large extent about these topics, um, theism is not really such a big issue anymore in philosophy departments. It's just ignored as a topic, and I found that strange, um, because it seems to me quite obvious that it's a topic that many people have very strong views about, um, etc. Okay, so when um, I started thinking about the question of this evening, mm. why is there something rather than nothing, for now I'll focus on that big question, perhaps the biggest of metaphysics, I thought, well... Um, there are, well, two ex extreme, I'll call it extreme positions you can have. You could say, well, there is, if there is an explanation, there's going to be a scientific explanation, and that's that. There is another side that says, well, there is 
a god. That's a metaphysical explanation of how things are. Um, and it seems that a lot of the debate is going on between these two uh, sides, uh, between these two extreme sides of the debate. My goal is to bring these questions, the big metaphysical questions about why there is something rather than nothing back onto the philosophical center stage, as it were. So I want to find ways of thinking about these questions that are not going to be either condemned as um, religious in a way that many of us no longer find adequate um, or satisfying or overly scientific. So in order to um, try and uh, get you to see my point of view, I'd first of all like to um, draw your attention to the fact that to a question like why is there something rather than nothing, we can give different kinds of answers. Um, we could be looking for a causal explanation mm. for why there is something rather than nothing. And causal explanations, typically, we turn to the natural sciences to. Um, okay, so, and as we just heard, the sciences have certain answers up to a point, and we may expect many more answers from the natural sciences about things that right now seem mysterious. But causal explanations are not the only kinds of explanation that are out there. Um, in fact, uh, even within the natural sciences, um, many of the explanations that are in place are non-causal. And I'll just give a very um, simple example when we ask ourselves why the number seven is not divisible by three, um, probably the explanation of this fact is going to involve some story about the primeness of seven, about this characteristic, um, which makes a prime number only divisible by, by one and by itself. So seven would not be divisible by three. We have thereby given an explanation of a certain fact, and that explanation was not a causal explanation. That's just, you know, perfectly fine, happens all the time. So in the math case, um, one might say, well, this is something like a conceptual explanation. We said what it involves or what it entails to be prime. Mm. Um, but there are other kinds of non-causal explanations. For example, um, we could explain a certain item or a certain fact in terms of its purpose rather than in terms of its physical workings. For example, um, an explanation of a computer could involve a very uh, complex description of how, I don't know, electrical signals uh, interact with the hardware or something like that. But we could also explain a computer as a device that is designed to process and store information. So in that, in that way, we would have described and explained the computer in terms of its purpose or in terms of its function. So um, you probably see where I'm getting at. I think that um, a question like, why is there something rather than nothing, um, might best be answered with um, an answer that concerns its purpose and not so much its cause. And the reason for that is that I think if we try to give a causal answer, almost necessarily we're going to, well, theism and uh, scientists are going to run into some kind of conflict, um, which I think should be avoided. If religion is uh, supposed to be taken seriously at all, it has to be in agreement with science, and mm. that's just that. So that's also one of the things I assume. And only when we give a causal answer to this question, these two get into conflict. So I just mentioned that science, I think, should, should always have priority. But at the same time, I find that um, religious people's um, beliefs and convictions, and also religious people's experiences, should be taken seriously. Obviously, up to a point, there is a limit to what's reasonable and what isn't. Um, but sometimes my impression is that uh, people who have any sort of theistic inclinations um, come out as unreasonable on the utterly scientific picture. And that's something I would like to avoid. 
So what I'm looking for is a way of reconciling the positions from a philosophical point of view, a way of perhaps giving an explanation uh, of the non-causal kind for the question, uh, why is there something rather than nothing, uh, from a point of view that doesn't reduce religious sentiments to wishful thinking. And I'll stop at that. That's great, thank you. <laughs> Jessica, so Hinduism as a, as a worldview or a religion, just as diverse as any other school of philosophy, African philosophy, European philosophy. So when we talk about Hinduism, we're not, we haven't got like a set of core doctrines like you might have mm -hmm. uh, Catholic Christianity or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I assume it's got lots of different ways it can help solve these three mysteries. I'm going to push you with a question, although you're going to set out your stool as well, because mm -hmm. I want to hear as well your view within there as to whether there's any branches of Hinduism you think we can rule out or whether there's some versions which are particularly helpful in solving these mysteries. Ooh, okay. So ruling out, I'm not my job to rule out, um, but I will focus on one school that I think has kind of philosophy at its core. Mm. And in a way, by speaking to a range of global sort of philosophy stroke religions, particularly Asian ones, a particular one in Hinduism called Vedanta, I want to speak to a, a worldview that doesn't really see this and this view as in conflict. Mm. Right. So I start off by kind of just saying globally, there are a huge range of philosophies that take existence as their inspirational source for reflection. Um, and, you know, from that perspective, just take a moment to realize that the contemporary fight between Christian monotheism and scientific materialism can look like actually very much a minority concern in the wider global and historic history, right? We shouldn't assume that that dominates all of thought across the range of philosophies globally. People are much more invested in a shared set of insights that inspire both philosophy and science and religion. And that's kind of interesting when you look at the Asian religions and you see, for instance, Taoism, which is trying to analyze reality in terms of forces that balance and flow in relation to each other, or Buddhism, which observes the changing flow of phenomena of whatever kind we see and questions our way of analyzing the universe, or Jainism, uh, which says reality can be analyzed from many different perspectives. There isn't one single system. There isn't one computational ontology that captures it all. So we've got a range of different options. Hinduism interests me partly because it takes precisely the mystery of existence, the fundamental reality we see unfolding around us, as the core of its insights, at least in the tradition I'm looking at. So if you go back 3,000 years to a hymn in the Vedas called the Nasa Diya Sukta that Carl Sagan cited in his classic series, Cosmos, uh, it starts off, Na asad asit no sad asit, uh, tadanim. In the beginning was not being all that we see around us, forces, space-time, nor even non-being, a kind of big empty space. It says, there was neither air nor space beyond it, right? This is 3,000 years ago. They're thinking speculatively about what must have been the source of everything. And they say, well, the ways that we think about the universe, whatever must have been the source, must have been fundamentally more basic than either of those images, mm -hmm. neither stuff, space-time, nor a big empty space. Uh, and this text goes on and says, you know, at some point something must have burst forth in energy, generated the forms and beings and forces we see. But this ancient hymn ends with, but who really knows? Right? So having had the, the mystery of existence, we now have the skepticism of a quite a well-formed philosophical insight. Who really knows what the origin is? It says where it was, what it came from, how it happened. Even the gods come after the generation of existence. And the last line of this ancient text is, maybe the highest God in heaven knows, and then it says, or maybe it doesn't, right? So there's this like fabulous little moment of like, we have a deep question here mm -hmm. for everyone to engage in, and we should not accept over simple answers mm -hmm. that take the easy route. Now what we get is three different key insights that come out of this ancient text. Right, which they think are true no matter which perspective you take on what kind of thing it is. Here's what we seem to find. One, if we look at the causal and constitutive generation of the world, all that we see, everything is formed in some way and out of something. 
roll that back, and what you have is a world of contingencies. Everything comes out of a certain circumstance. At some point at the bottom, you have to have something which is what we call self-existent. Right? Whether this is physics or whether this is religion or whether this is philosophy, something has to be there which was not formed by something else. Yeah. Even if you have a circle causally, even if you have an infinite regress causally, then the whole thing has its nature innately. Right? So what we get is a self-existent reality. Two, we get a self-natured reality. Everything could have been different, as far as we can tell, from how it is. Right? Most of the things we see, we can see being contingent, as we put it. Carpet could have been blue. <coughs> I could have been <coughs> redhead. I always wanted to be a redhead. Right? Everything could have been different. These natures are contingent, mm -hmm. but you can't have contingencies all the way back. That seems to be, by definition, to the nature of yeah. contingency. So that you have to have something which is of its own character, a, a nature that generates the rest. So there has to be something which is innately self-natured. Three, there has to be something which has an immense generative, creative, causal power mm -hmm. that is constantly working upward through all we see, and which, by the way, doesn't just generate the same thing over and over and over again, like a repeating computer program. It generates level upon level of what we call emergence. Right, so from the most fundamental level, whatever that is, up, up through the levels, whether it's to energy, whether it's to matter, whether it's uh, atoms, chemicals, uh, to organic life, mm. to consciousness, to thought, to meaning, to stories, to emotions, to values, right? All of this seems, it, all of this clearly must be generated out of whatever is the foundation of existence, okay. right? So these three insights, Self-existence, self-nature, causal power, mm -hmm. all for Hinduism must be the case, and that should be something everyone can agree on. Could you just say how that's different mm -hmm. to Richard Swinburne's view? And we can mm -hmm. open the discussion up and mm -hmm. interject at this point in the discussion. Because Richard's view seems quite close to that, in that you've got this self-existent mm -hmm. cause, this thing that couldn't have failed not to exist, that brings into being everything, like this, you know, this Hindu... Uh, metaphors of the root of being and it mm. growing into the tree of life and stuff. Seems mm. very close to a view like Aquinas or someone like this, mm. one of Richard Swinburne's uh, favorite scholars. Would you say that's quite closely linked to that? Yeah, Aquinas is a, a fabulous guy. Um, I think <laughs> the one thing I will say that Hinduism wants to dial back the added uh, assumptions you build on that philosophically. So okay. there's clearly a source, whether it's a person, whether being a person is the highest form of existence you could imagine or the only cause for the world, mm -hmm. that's out there still to be determined, right? And, not, and some Hindus are theists and some are not. Lots of other religions have different views on that. So I think the, whether you add on to this a number of further uh, doctrines, including personhood, uh, afterlife, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, mm -hmm. that's another matter. Right, but okay. you do have a philosophical insight at the core. Okay, for the why there's something rather than nothing mm -hmm. type thing. Okay, Richard Swinburne, you've, we're talking about causality. I think we all tend to agree with the Darwinian explanation for the complexity yes. of life. There are no issues there on the panel. The one which you've all spoken about most of all is the, perhaps the biggest question and the, the mystery of existence in the singular, why there's something rather than nothing. And there's two key themes that have came out of the answers, one of simplicity and one of causality, which Sylvia spoke about at length a moment ago. Richard Swinburne, you've got an, an argument, quite a famous argument for why the cause of the world, talking about causality, would have to be a person rather than some prior physical fact. Why it'd have to be something, a person, some non-physical consciousness that kicked off the Big Bang rather than something else. Uh, yes, but just let me make two other remarks first. Um, I have no quarrel at all with anything Richard Dawkins said. I entirely agree. But the question is, why is uh, these laws operative? And the answer is, of course, because, as you said, the laws of physics are crucial here. Uh, but then why are the laws of physics operative? And, okay, there's a multiverse. But that will only produce these laws if it itself has laws. And so, in the end, you are left with the laws of science. And the laws of science uh, postulate that every 
thing in the world. It might be the atoms of our world or the, or the chunks of, of the so-called nothingness in, the, in the, the big space which out of which universes evolve behaves in exactly the same way, and that's what law-likeness means. And um, it means that everything, just to take the, that we're talking about atoms, but it the same applies of whatever the constitution of the multiverse is, it behaves in exactly the same way. And the question is why? Um, it's no good just saying there's a law of nature. The law of nature just is that they behave in this way, full stop. So why do they behave in this way? And they are a large number of separate things. And unless something causes them to behave in the same way, we are left once again with a multitude of things. And that's why I think there's no scientific explanation of these things, because scientific explanation just consists in postulating that a lot of things behave in exactly the same way. And we want something a little simpler than that. And in fact, there is a model of causality, which is the question you were coming on to. Just before we do the model of causality, can we give Richard an opportunity to... I find this the most extraordinary this. idea. The, Richard Swinburne is saying that we need a special explanation for why every electron, every proton, every neutron, every particle behaves in exactly the same way. How could they not behave in the same way? They're all the same kind of thing. That's okay. what they do. Well, why are the constitutions of the universe exactly the same kind of thing? In, if you define the kind of thing in terms of its powers, and I agree that's a reasonable way to do it, why are all the kind of things in the universe have the same powers in the sense of attracting, for example, every other one in, in accordance with uh, um, uh, Newton's law of gravity or whatever else the law is? That question remains. There are two separate questions there. One is, why do these particles have the properties that they do? And, the, and that is a profound question. The other is, why do they all have the same properties, which is the one you're stressing? Yeah. And that's not profound at all. Yeah. Um, that, that simply follows from the... Um, right. Well, I mean, you, in that case, I mean, if you say they have the same powers because that's what they are, the question then is, why are all the things in the universe the same in this respect, <coughs> that they are, uh, have the power to attract every other bo body in the universe in accordance with mm dash over r squared. That is <laughs> why well, it then, <coughs> If you are saying that, that you need a god to explain why all these electrons and protons are behaving the, the same way, a god capable of doing that would have to be supremely complicated, and yet you're saying that but he's why? supremely simple. Why do you think he's got to be exceedingly complicated? <coughs> because he's got to hold all these electrons in his little hands. No, How can no, he possibly he's be simple? he's not that sort of God at all. He has no extension in space. Okay, I think that's obviously um, a triple point. But that <coughs> comes back to the question of causality, in fact, because uh, there is a model of causality which is entirely not the scientific one, which we use all the time. The <coughs> nature of a scientific model of causality is it postulates laws of nature acting on initial states, mm. producing from them other states. But if you are, a model of personal action is not at all like that. If you ask any one of the audience, why are you here? They're not saying, well, there was a scientific law in virtue of which, etc., which led to my being here. They say, well, um, there were some interesting talks going on, I believe. Um, uh, I believe that they are coming at this time and that the way to get there is this. And I have the purpose of hearing, of having these, and I have the purpose of getting here. So we explain all human behavior in terms of the powers of humans, in terms of their beliefs about what the effects of their actions will be, and in virtue of their desires to produce these beliefs. And that is a model by which we explain ordinary human behavior, which of course consists in a large number of atoms buzzing around in our bodies, but <laughs> what, what explains them is uh, something fairly simple. Me! <laughs> Jessica, do you want to come in on this point? Um, 
this debate it's, about simplicity and It's just an interesting case. That argument is made in about seven, 700 uh, in, by Indian mm. texts, that there's a, a striking coherence across the range of phenomena that, that shape the universe. And the Buddhists, who are very anti the idea that there's a shared coherent thing yep. going on, uh, attacked it quite strongly. The response philosophically is what we call the counterfactual argument, mm. which says basically if you didn't have some coherence that keeps things... That in, that in a sense, a coherent nature unfolding in everything, you'd have a chaos. You'd have static. Uh, the Indian texts say humans would become elephants, would become <laughs> seeds, would become trees at every given moment of the time. Yeah. Right. So there is a coherence, but in a sense, it seems that what both positions share is essentially the observation that there's a coherent nature uh, that constitutes the cosmos. Mm -hmm. right? Without the cosmos, you wouldn't have that coherent nature. Whether What that comes from is another issue. Uh, so maybe the issue is more whether coherence in itself, whether that unity of character that unfolds in laws and, and in the different materials we have is striking or not. Is it significant or is it really, doesn't really matter, mm. right? And some of that's about whether it could have been otherwise. We are going to take a quick break now, but we would love to hear your thoughts. Do drop us an email at unbelievable at premier.org.uk or you can get in touch via social media at unbelievablefe for Twitter or facebook.com forward slash Premier Unbelievable. You're listening to Unbelievable, teaming up with the Pan Psychast Philosophy Podcast. And we're going to be back in just a moment to hear more from these amazing guests. You would call yourself an atheist? I would, yes. I would call myself a Christian humanist. One of the big themes over the history of what we now think of as science has been questioning the exceptionalism of humankind. I think the critical thing is what gives something value. Would you say that minds construct meaning or detect meaning? I have had made from a little piece of my arm something that could reasonably be called a second brain. I think one of the real challenges that evolution by natural selection puts to Christian belief is the idea that Welcome back to this special Unbelievable, where we're showcasing a discussion that was recorded in London earlier this summer by the Pan Psychast Philosophy podcast team. The debate, which we've split into two parts, gathered four incredible minds. Richard Dawkins, representing science and atheism, Jessica Frazier on Hinduism, Sylvia Jonas speaking on Jewish philosophy, and Richard Swinburne defending Christianity. The four of these guys are being moderated by Pan Psychast host, Jack Symes. Sylvia, you, I said you made friends and enemies of everybody, and you, were, you explained your view very well just a moment ago. But I thought your view in particular was against this view of Swinburne's, which that theism can serve as a type of scientific hypothesis, because the more progress science makes, the further we push God back against the wall. And that's not the kind of theism that we want. I think Bonhoeffer has a nice quote about this somewhere, doesn't he? Right, yes. So, yeah. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, uh, if we conceive of uh, God and theism that way, and with science progressing, then um, theism is always going to have its back against the wall, mm. and that's not what we want. Like The, uh, uh, the God of the gaps is... Uh, is an expression that is often used that um, <coughs> we can we can fill in God wherever science hasn't gotten to yet, or mm -hmm. like yeah, for whatever question the uh, science doesn't have an answer yet. Is this an exception to that rule, though? Because uh, tools of physical science aren't going to be able to stretch beyond pre Big Bang. So, is is Richard Swinburne okay to say here that a non physical, non scientific explanation can never be pushed back against the wall because science will never reach that type of Course. Well, it can, uh, ordinary ones can be pushed back a bit, but uh, if you postulate an omnipotent God, then it can't be pos uh, pushed back anymore, because if there was an, another God that uh, caused the omnipotent God, the omnipotent God wouldn't be omnipotent. So once you've got there, you do reach a stop. 
And as regards uh, the simplicity, um, or, uh, I think perhaps ordinary detective examples or historical examples will illustrate this point. Um, suppose you find all the coins in a, in a deposit have the same head on them. Uh, you're not going to look for a separate explanation for each of the, of the heads. You're going to look for one explanation which explains them. And if you can do it by one explanation, one entity which brings them about, you're not going to look for two entities. Fewness of entities, um, substances, as philosophers call them, as well as simplicity of properties. In other words, a, a number zero as opposed to a number 2.3546. Um, these are the criteria we're both in history and in detective work and in physics that you're looking for. Well, Richard Swinburne a moment ago said any scientifically minded person would believe that God is the ultimate cause. Why is it about this explanation that you, you're not happy to entertain, Richard? Is it, Don't this, you know? Is it, is it simplicity? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it obvious? <laughs> is, it sim is it simplicity, the main point, though? Or is it just something non-physical? Richard Swinburne is saying that God is simple because he's a single entity. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How can he be a single entity if he's simultaneously controlling the universe, every particle in the universe, he's forgiving our sins, mm. he's giving us free will, he's deciding whether or not you'll die or not at a, on a certain day. Such a thing is not a single simple entity. It's a highly complicated mammoth great Big, fat entity. <laughs> well, take another example of a very simple entity. Uh, uh, a particle <coughs> of matter here. This particle of matter is influencing all sorts of other particles of matter all over the universe. How can it do that with just being one particle of matter? Well, it does, according to uh, uh, the law of gravity. Well, yes, so what? I mean, that. Well, you were saying that in order to have a large number of effects, it had to be a big thing. Mm. In order to do the things that God is supposed to be doing, he cannot be simple. He, he is an entity of subjective consciousness. He thinks about things. He has will, free will. He has the power to influence anything in the world that he wants to do. He even does the things that the Christians believe and all the other religions believe. How can you possibly say that such an entity is a single, simple entity? Well, I'm giving you the example that an entity which is a pretty small and unconscious entity can have a very large number of effects. And if God can have a large, very large number of effects and yet be um, <coughs> virtually uh, <laughs> even smaller than an electron, in other words, having no spatial extension, um, why shouldn't you say so? It is the nature of science to postulate entities to ex which are unobservable and have strange <coughs> properties in order to explain observable entities. Uh, we postulated atoms, etc., with their properties in order to explain regular combinations of substances by weight and volume. We postulate um, uh, fundamental particles explain, to explain this. These fundamental particles turn out to be rather strange in uh, having uh, uh, both uh, uh, um, uh, wave-like and particle-like properties. But if they are able to produce this effect, then that's reason for believing them to be true. And of course you need an omnipotent being in order to produce all that, but you should go for the simplest one you can have. And the simplest mm -hmm. one will have simple properties, and it will not be extended, because if it is extended, it would have parts, and they would have ways of behaving. Is Hinduism uniquely placed to solve this sort of tension here? So the criticism is, the beginning must be just as complex as the thing that it creates, just kicks the can down the road. You've got the same problem mm. further on, says Dawkins to Swinburne. <coughs> Swinburne says, well, you need an uncaused cause, something separate. Does Hinduism give us that without all of the, the baggage of some of these, <laughs> these other views, to put it Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, because in some ways we've got here, we've got a, a, a multi-part nature so if we, let's say we've got all the, the the atoms the particles have essentially <coughs> the same sorts of natures but there are many of them and there, there are laws of natures and they have their own character and there are multiple ones so we've got a coherent universe but multiple factors going on in that universe coherence 
is agreed upon here, mm. right? That there is complexity is also agreed upon here. So what exactly is the point of dissension? The point of dissension is whether those things are unified in something that is significant in and of itself, right? And I think here we want to say, uh, it sounds like you want to say no. They're very different things coming together to make a cosmos. They have no intrinsic uh, unifying character to them. To speak on the Hinduism point, one of the three major arguments that you see <coughs> in the ancient uh, Indian scholastic world, one of them is that to have multiple factors that are able to causally impact each other, mm. to make up things together, right? Um, and in any sense, to form a shared cosmos, there has to be a, a link. There has to be some ontological underlying medium that allows them to have those connections and make a cosmos, whether they are laws or whether they're particles or materials or whatever. So on that account, it's hard to see how an utterly pluralistic universe works in that way. There must be some form of unity that links those factors and enables the coherent, complex universe to unfold, mm. right? That seems to be the case. Whether you want it then to be a person with will and intention, that seems a bigger part of what's really at stake here. Okay. Good. Does anyone want to come in on any of those points just there on the same topic? I just wanted to um, actually ask the question, because this is something that's really been puzzling me for a long time, how a being or an entity um, that is so different from ordinary mid-sized objects um, with causal powers can have the causal powers to bring about everything there is here. So I think that's some, something many people find very puzzling. And when you made the comparison with fundamental particles, um, and, and your argument was, well, we postulated these entities at some point. Um, eventually, we continued. The scientific story continued. We managed to unravel <clears throat> some of the mysteries. Um, those particles became less mysterious. The question popped into my mind, well, do you think potentially this is something that could happen with the, the, the divine entity as well? Like, because you made this comparison, so can science ever get to a point where perhaps, you know, God is an unraveled mystery? Well, of course, I don't know where science will get to, but what science will get to is the scientific law. I don't know what the law will be, but it doesn't matter what the law will be. It may get to a beginning, or it may not, uh, but uh, uh, it will get to laws. And um, laws are claims about how every particle or whatever it's made of is going to behave in certain respects in exactly the same way. And I agree with Richard's point. You, you can think that as a defining characteristic of the, the constituents. That's fair enough. But the question is why the constituents have just the same finding. And that's why the, the, if you can get, be, you need to get beyond that if you're to have an explanation because you, you, you've, you've reached a terminus where everything is behaving in exactly the same way. And so it's worth looking at the other mode in which, by which we explain things and explain personal behavior. We explain personal behavior in virtue of the powers of people. We've all got powers, pretty limited ones, and they differ a bit with each other, what we can do. Uh, we've all got beliefs, and that influences what we do. Uh, we've all got desires that, that influences what we do, and the beliefs influence uh, the steps that we take to influence our desires. So, um, uh, if you can explain in terms of one entity, um, you're not gonna, it's not going to be a scientific one, but it could be a personal one, because you can explain it in terms of someone who is something like us. And the, the, uh, uh, I remember the Genesis starts with uh, um, uh, the God make, made humans in his image after his likeness. There are similarities, and the similarities are that in this respect he is a personal being. But of course his powers are immensely greater, and his knowledge is immensely greater, and his desires are for the good. Um, and um, this, we've got all this model, it's all ready. We've just got to blow it up a bit. It's ready there to explain things. 
What? So uh, just on, just Zoe. one further question, because I, I'm, I'm, I was wondering about your exchange, the exchange between the two of you, and you were saying, well, this being would have to be infinitely complex in order mm. to achieve all these things that the being allegedly achieves. Um, but what you seem to be saying just now was that, well, we, we won't get to a point where we're going to be able to fully explicate the nature of this being, right? I mean, we're going to be able to say things like, well, it's an omnipotent being, and we're going to have to be satisfied with that. So we, we cannot inquire any deeper into the nature of this being. Oh, sure, I wasn't saying we know everything about God. I'm just saying we know in this respect what he's like. Uh, sure, of course, yes, uh, obviously. If he's uh, like us, we're not simple. Well, uh, as regards our, us being, um, I mean, you are thinking of us as a chunk of brain or a chunk of brain plus body. Um, I, these are the causes of our thoughts, but they're not the same as our thoughts. Mm. They are the causes of our desires, not the same as our desires. Do you think and they God are the causes <coughs> of us? But we are, have a unified uh, attitude. I mean, uh, when we hear a sound and see a light and so on, um, it's not that part of us sees us, uh, hears a sound and the other part sees a light. It's a unified self <coughs> which is uh, seeing these things mm -hmm. and which is aware of its own beliefs at the same time. Of course, it's uh, causally dependent, at any rate, in, on this mm -hmm. earth, uh, on a body, but uh, what is dependent on a body is a center of consciousness to, of which these are properties, and therefore the properties uh, won't, won't be extended uh, in the sense in which uh, the property of uh, this carpet is square. Do you think God can read our thoughts? Can he read the thoughts of everybody in this room, yes. all eight billion people in the world? Yes. And he's simple. He's reading all these thoughts, and he's simple. He's a simple entity in the sense that he has properties, but they are very big properties. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, big, uh, but you're belief. using simplicity as an argument in his favor on sort of Occam's razor grounds. Yeah. It's a simple explanation because he's one entity. But he's not a simple entity. He's reading eight billion people's thoughts simultaneously. But that's but not the issue at play. It the is issue the is, issue. The issue is... I'm, I'm, I kind, kind of don't agree that this is the right argument, but I do think your point is important. It's a causal simple thing. It's a single cause which generates all of it. That's your point of your coin example, yeah. right? We wouldn't say, oh my God, there are peaches all over the room. You wouldn't say, oh my God, everyone, some random people all came in and put peaches on the floor. Right? Mm -hmm. You'd assume there's one person. So there can be causal simplicity without the entity being simple. Mm. Having said that, whether that argument ultimately works is another thing, but it doesn't require causal simplicity for the entity itself to be simple. But the argument in favor of him being simple is that we want simple explanations. That's Richard Sim Simburn's Sim point. Yeah. We want a simple explanation, and I'm saying God cannot possibly be a simple explanation. He's a very complex explanation. Well, that is all we've got time for today. We do hope you enjoyed that debate, courtesy of the pan Philosophy podcast team. Please do join us next time to hear the concluding part of their discussion. As always, we'd love to know what you think. Do get in touch at premierunbelievable.com. Thank you for listening and see you next time.